Greetings. My name is Father Andrew Summerson, and on behalf of the Lumen Christi Institute, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event. Lumen Christi was founded in 1997 by Catholic scholars at the University of Chicago, and its mission is to make the Catholic intellectual tradition a living dialogue partner at the University of Chicago and in our broader society through courses, lectures, summer seminars for graduate and undergraduate students, and virtual events like these. If you like tonight's webinar, I want to alert you to some of Lumen Christi's other upcoming events. Together with the Kazanis Society, the Institute will continue to present that webinar series. Its next installment will be entitled, Mary and Muslims, Bridge or Barrier. This will be a conversation featuring Father Jason Welly, Dr. Rita George Turkovic, and Zeki Seri Toprak on Wednesday, August 18th at 6 p.m. Central. We'll also continue this monastic webinar series with another father, John Bayer, the monastics before the scholastics, an introduction to medieval monastic theology. That will be Sunday, August 22 at 6 p.m. Central. Today's event is the first of July, but it's the second of our summer webinar series. It's co-presented with our friends at Our Lady of Dallas, Cistercian Abbey in Irving, Texas. In partnership with them, Lumen Christi aims to bring into focus the vibrant monastic intellectual tradition that God is working to build up in their monastery, which is visible in their apostolate at Cistercian Preparatory School, and also with some of the monks who teach at the University of Dallas. The Summer Monastic Wisdom series puts this on full display to a wider audience through this online format. I would like to thank our co-sponsors for this webinar series, including the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture at the University of Dallas. Now, you can support us in three ways. You can join our mailing list and follow Lumen Christi on social media, share the good word about these events with others. Word of mouth remains the most effective means of inviting others into the Catholic intellectual tradition. At the end of the event, you'll be invited to participate in a survey that will help Lumen Christi gauge what they are doing right, what needs improving, and filling it out, you'll enter to win a gift card to our favorite independent bookstore, the Seminary Co-op. Finally, you can consider supporting Lumen Christi financially by donating today to help the Institute to continue to put on events like these, free for viewers like you at lumenchristi.org slash donate. During tonight's event, there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience. You can, however, post a question at any time. In fact, you're encouraged to do so, so you don't forget it, using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. In addition to questions being read by the moderator, that's me, uh, we will give also the opportunity for you to voice your own questions, uh, if you so desire, uh, for our speaker. Today's program is being recorded and will stream from our YouTube page and be posted onto our website. So it is that easy for you to revisit the talk. A link will be included in your confirmation email and it will be shared tomorrow and you would do well to even share it along uh, with those that might not have been able to participate this evening. So now I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished speaker. Father Abbot Peter Verhalen was born in Midland, Texas and he made a solemn profession as a monk at Our Lady of Dallas in 1980. And he was elected abbot of Our Lady of Dallas, Cistercian Abbey, on February 15th, 2012. And he'll say an amateur, I'll say accomplished, but we will call him a Latinist. Um, here to speak to us today on a school for the Lord's service, a meditation on the rule of St. Benedict, is Father Peter Verhalen. 
I now invite him to unmute himself and to show his screen to begin his presentation. Father Peter. Thank, thank you very much, Father Andrew. Um, and thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, it's a real delight um, to be invited by Lumen Christi for the Abbey to be invited by Lumen Christi to participate in this monastic wisdom series. And it's a real delight for me personally to be invited to um, share a few thoughts with you all on the rule of St. Benedict. The um, rule of St. Benedict is an ancient text uh, written probably about 530, 540 BC, AD. And it's become the standard text uh, for most monastics um, in the Western world. The um, text itself is fascinating. It's uh, a, a source for life in the sixth century AD. So scholars can look at the text and say, well, what do we know from this text about the way people lived and organized themselves in the sixth century? It's a text that people can study to understand the state of Latin as it was progressing slowly from ancient Latin, classical Latin of Cicero, for example, to the modern languages. So into the Middle Ages and the modern languages. However, this evening, I'm going to look at the rule as a text monks base their lives on, monks live according to. It's the rule that St. Benedict wrote for monks, for men. I will try to point out um, that it's a rule for men and women. I'll also try to point out that it's a rule for uh, religious and non-religious, so for monks and for lay people. It's an extremely valuable text, I think, for our own spiritual lives. The topic specifically is the school for the Lord's service. I would like to look at several words uh, connected with that phrase. At the end of the prologue, at the beginning of his last paragraph in the prologue, St. Benedict says that he must now establish a school for the Lord's service. And as we go through the talk this evening, I will say a few words about must establish, a few words about we, so the Benedict himself who is establishing this school, a few words about the school, and a few words about the Lord's service. I think this topic will provide a great entrance into the rule. It's also a topic that will, um, frankly, be very humbling because Benedict was obviously a great abbot. Um, in addition to being a saint, he was a wonderful administrator. And it's uh, always embarrassing, certainly humbling, for a man or a woman to look at the ideal. And Benedict himself is something of an ideal. In the Cistercian tradition, there is a, a great Cistercian saint, Saint Bernard of Clairvaux, who lived in the uh, 12th century. And on the feast of St. Benedict, he wrote, Benedict was an abbot, and so am I. But what an abbot he was, and what an abbot am I. There is one title, but in the second abbot, there's only the shadow of that great title. There's one ministry, but also how unlike are the ministers, and how unlike are the ways they minister. I hope that by the end of this presentation this evening, you will have some sense for why St. Bernard could say that St. Benedict was such an amazing abbot, so inimitable. And I think you will also have a sense for why we should strive to imitate him in establishing in our own lives a school for the Lord's service. I believe that to understand the rule itself, we have to know something about the life of St. Benedict. And there are two sources for that life. Um, the rule, which Benedict wrote and in which he reveals himself, but also the life of St. Benedict as written by St. Gregory the Great, Pope St. Gregory the Great, about 40 or 50 years after Benedict died. And Benedict himself says, I mean, St. Gregory the Great himself says 
that in order to understand who Benedict was, we should read his rule. And then to understand the rule, we should read the life of St. Benedict. In reading that life, we need to keep in mind that it's not a modern biography. St. Gregory strove in his biography of Benedict to show how the same Holy Spirit who inspired the sacred authors as they wrote the books of the Bible also inspired men and women in the Italy of his day to live out, to exemplify the teachings that are embedded in the scriptures. And so if we look at the life of Benedict, St. Gregory says, we will see exemplified the teachings of the Bible. In fact, Benedict, Benedict's life begins with a very famous phrase. There was a man worthy of being venerated. Blessed, that's Benedictus, blessed in name and in grace. For those in Gregory's day who knew scripture like the back of their hand, they heard in that description of St. Benedict, blessed in name and in grace, an allusion to Abraham, our father in faith, in whom Moses said, God blessed all peoples, all families of nations will be blessed in you, Abraham. And so Gregory, in writing the life of St. Benedict, points out that God is blessing the people of Italy through this man. And now I'm going to share my screen and show you a little bit about the geography of Benedict's life. So um, St. Gregory organizes the life of St. Benedict, a model of each of the holy men of the scriptures around several places. Uh, he was, Benedict was born in 480 um, in Norcia, uh, modern day Norcia. It was Norcia at the time of Benedict. His family was uh, sufficiently well-to-do to provide him with the best of an education in his own day. And Benedict end up, ended up going to Rome to finish that education. But there famously, Benedict realized that his peers were going off the abyss in their studies. They were going off the abyss into a life of vice. And Gregory says that Benedict wisely chose to withdraw his foot from that abyss, from falling into that abyss. And then he goes on to say, knowingly unknowing. So knowingly uneducated, knowingly what God asks, unknowing, of the vice of the city of Rome, and then wisely untaught. So again, wisely in the ways of God, but untaught in the ways of the world. And one of the beautiful things about Benedict's rule and Benedict's own life is that it is so familiar to us. He speaks to people who in many ways are very familiar to us. And so when Benedict describes the vice in the city of Rome, or when Gregory says that Benedict withdrew from Rome, he is saying that he is withdrawing from the same things that, if, that uh, confront us, a life of vice, but also the life of ambition. And Gregory will say that that life of ambition is pursued and learned to, learned to be pursued in Rome by young men and young women who choose not to live a life of integrity who choose rather to live a life of falsehood. They say one thing, but they mean another. They say this is good when it's really bad. And Benedict chose to abandon that and to seek nothing but to please God, to live in the presence of God, pleasing God. He next went to Subiaco, the very famous Subiaco. Um, and you can see on the map, um, slightly south and east of Rome, where he lived in a cave for several years and learned the monastic way, which was fundamentally, the, fun, the monastic way was fundamentally for Benedict at this time, of why a way of coming to live in the presence of God, coming back to the self, being aware of the self, 
and living in God's presence. In a sense, the image is valuable because Benedict was in a cave. He was in the ground. He was hidden away and living with himself, in a sense, with this earthly self. And it's in that cave that he understands who he is as a fallen human being and understands that God raises him up. It's in that cave that he overcomes Satan and then is qualified to become a teacher of other men and women. So at Subiaco, Benedict lives this life initially as a hermit, not in order to change and to learn something so much as to reveal his own character, namely a man blessed by God and a blessing for other men and women. As a consequence of being such a holy man, a servant of God, a man of God, he sought out as an abbot. And indeed, he has many experiences. One is a terrible experience in which a group of, of wayward monks seek him. And contrary to his initial in, uh, inclinations, he agrees to serve as their abbot, even though he knows that they do not want to have him as abbot if he's going to ask them to change. And they end up trying to kill him. He goes back and is eventually able to found 12 monasteries around Subiaco. But then a blessing for his monks. He was a blessing then for those monks at Subiaco in those various abbeys. But he realizes that there's a priest in the neighborhood who is so envious of Benedict that he strives to not only kill Benedict, but he also strives to mislead the other monks. And Benedict, a blessing for others, decides that for the sake of the other monks, he will depart. And perhaps it's in this decision to depart from those 12 monasteries, taking just a few monks with himself, that he decides first to write down his rule. He departs and with the three monks goes on to Subiaco. And so at this point, I would like to get into the rule itself perhaps written down for the first time when Benedict goes off to Monte Cassino and establishes his monastery there, leaving behind those 12 monasteries at Subiaco. At the end of the prologue, Benedict writes, therefore we must establish a school for the Lord's service. I think that simple sentence contains within itself something of a mission statement for a monastery, at least a monastery as St. Benedict would establish that monastery, would set that monastery up. He says, we must establish, constituenda est, it must be established. And you say, why? What's the need? What is the mission of this school, the school for the Lord's service, that Benedict feels will be accomplished? Well, the little word, therefore, sends you back to the preceding verses. And Benedict writes in those preceding verses about the inevitability of final judgment. Benedict writes, and if fleeing the punishments of hell, we want to reach eternal life while there is still time. And we are in this body and do have time to fulfill all these things by the light of this life. We must now run and do what will benefit us in eternity. While in Rome, Benedict saw his peers falling off that cliff into the life of vice, into the life of ambition based on a lack of integrity. He knew that there is life after this life. He knew that there's a judge, there's a judgment, and that judge wants to offer us eternal life. But if we choose to turn ourselves against that judge, to turn away from that offer, then we will find ourselves disinherited by an angered father and consigned to eternal damnation. 
that's a pretty tough start for this school. The first element of this mission statement seems to be the need to establish a community in which one can learn to face judgment and avoid the pains of hell. But I think there is, there are another three um, aspects to this mission statement. And they are typical of Benedict. The very first lines of the rule, the first three verses I put up on the screen, very famously, Benedict says, listen, my son, to the teachings of a master. Turn your heart's ear to him and receive the guidance of a loving father and carry it out effectively. And then moving down, that is why I am now directing my words to you. If one element of this mission statement is the need to prepare for final judgment. The second element is included in that first word, listen, and the second word, my son. Benedict is establishing a school with the mission of providing a personal relationship of meeting each man's, each woman's deepest longing for a personal relationship. In a relationship not with a friend or a spouse, but a relationship with a father, with a loving father, who is at the same time a teacher. So the teachings of a master. That same longing is found throughout you know, human history. We long for the Father who will guide us in love. In a sense, that's given perfect expression by St. Augustine at the beginning of his confessions. My heart is restless until it rests in you. My heart is restless. St. Benedict hears his son, his monk, saying, my heart is restless. And Benedict says, well, listen, listen, my son, whom I love, and I will teach you how to find your fatherland, how to find your home, how to return to that place from which you've departed. Mission statement goes on. Not only do these first three verses reveal each student, each human being, longing for a relationship with a loving father. But they also reveal, I think, an awareness on the part of the monk and Benedict recognizing that and speaking to that, that he, through lazy disobedience, has left home through lazy disobedience. So Benedict writes, listen to your loving father so that through the labor of obedience, you might return to the one from whom you have withdrawn through the laziness of disobedience. In that awareness of his lazy disobedience, the monk who comes to Benedict asking to enter the monastery acknowledges that he has time and again taken the easy path the path that has become easy after original sin, the easy path of disobedience. We tend to think of God and his commandments as the great naysayer, as the one who would limit our freedom and curtail our pleasures. And yet implicit in this line is the awareness that no, our disobedience is an act of laziness, and somehow there's a longing on my part, on each monk's part, and ultimately on the part of each human being to labor at obedience. And then finally, the third, fourth element of this 
implicit mission statement is in the last few lines. That's why I am now directing my words to you, my son, who renounce the promptings of your own will, taking up the labor of practicing obedience. And now looking for a noble challenge, you plan to serve under Christ, the true King, and take up the strong and noble weapons of obedience. The monk is longing, each human being is longing, Benedict suggests, for this noble challenge, not for the easy life, but for the noble challenge of serving the true king, of serving truth, of serving the one who truly does act sovereignly and govern this entire world, and who is ready to take up the glorious weapons, the noble weapons, the really strong weapons of obedience. And so the challenge, I think, would be, you know, to come up with a two-sentence, one-sentence, two-sentence mission statement um, for the whole rule based on um, what I've tried to say. But I would just point out, I'm not going to try to write those two sentences, I would just point out by way of summary that in establishing his school for the Lord's service, Benedict wants to lead his students to eternal life and away from eternal damnation. He wants to offer each of his students a personal relationship with a loving father. He wants to lead each of his students back home through the labor of obedience. And finally, he wants to provide each of his students with a truly noble and ennobling challenge. I think one of the reasons Benedict's rule has proven to be so enduring, one of the reasons Benedict is recognized as the father of Western monasticism and the patron of Europe, is that he identified these movements, these longings of the human heart, and he established his school to meet those. Going on. Benedict says, we must therefore establish the we, constituenda est ergo nobis. The school must be established by us. And so you ask, who is that founder? Well, you know, you can say, ultimately, it's Jesus Christ. You can say, well, it's those sources St. Benedict drew on primarily scripture. And if you look at the rule of St. Benedict, which is 40 or 50 pages long, there are hundreds of quotations from scripture. It's virtually a tapestry of scriptural quotations. Or you can say it's the monastic tradition. Benedict, in writing his rule, drew very heavily on scripture, but then on the whole monastic tradition, to the point that the first seven chapters and the prologue itself the spiritual section, as it were, is largely copied from another rule that preceded Benedict by maybe 50 years. And yet I think when Benedict says, we must establish a school, we, I think he's thinking about himself. Again, back at Subiaco, where he had, having grown to the point that he could establish those 12 monasteries as a holy man, to whom people would go in order to be blessed. When he left those monasteries behind, he established men in charge. And I would like to think he left with those men in charge his rule. And so indeed, he is establishing, we, Benedict, is establishing this school for the Lord's service. Now, who is that abbot? You know, who is Benedict? And so, as I said earlier, we can read the, uh, the life of St. Benedict by St. Gregory and get a, a very good sense for who he is. But we can also read the rule and obtain a wonderful understanding of Benedict, a nuanced understanding of who Benedict is. Reading through the rule quickly, you see that Benedict strives to say nothing, to command nothing, except what he hears in Scripture. You can see that Benedict strives to speak as a loving father to the monks, his sons. 
when he mitigates the practices of the monks of his day so that they, the monks under Benedict, can live life more comfortably, more realistically. For example, Benedict says that the monks of the Egypt would recite the entire Psalter of 150 Psalms in one day, and he, Benedict, knowing that his monks are not up to that, establishes an order for praying the Psalms that stretches over a whole week. When determining how much food and drink, he allows the monks to drink wine, even though real monks would not drink any wine at all. He provides plenty of food for the monks. In fact, if they have dietary needs, he provides for two main courses at each meal. He provides for monks to walk around the abbey when the monks, when the monks are supposed to be taking a siesta and resting in the afternoon to see that they are doing what they are supposed to do. Benedict strives again and again out of this charity to establish a rule that monks can follow. And he establishes the abbot as a man who has the discretion to adapt the rule to the needs of his monks. And that's most beautifully illustrated, I think, in the life of Benedict. Toward the end of his life, his one sister we know about, Stolastica, a religious woman, a nun, came to visit Benedict, as was her custom, and Benedict would meet with her in a little house outside the monastery, and they would engage in conversation, talking, as Benedict says, about holy things. And as it came time for Benedict to return to the monastery for the evening, she begged him to remain with him. And he said, no, I've got to go back to the monastery. I have to observe the rule. And his sister put her head down in her hands and began to pray to God that he stay with her that evening and they continue sharing about holy things. And all of a sudden a great storm came up such that Benedict could not go back to the monastery. The point of the story is that she loved greatly. The point of the story is that he loved the primacy, he learned the primacy of love over the primacy of, of observing regulations. So who is this abbot? Well, if you read through the rule quickly, you'll see that he is this man that strives again and again to mitigate the rules of the more austere observances so that his monks can follow them. You see that he is an, a man who, uh, who entrusts to the abbot discretion so that the abbot, taking into consideration the circumstances of his monks and of his day, can change the rules so that love is primary. But at the beginning of a chapter on the abbot, who he is, Benedict, I think, gives the key. Benedict says, as I posted on the slide, the abbot who is worthy to be over a monastery should always remember what he is called and fulfill with deeds the name of superior. For he's believed to represent Christ to be his viceroy, Christi Adra Vichas, to act in Christ's place. He's believed to represent Christ in the monastery, for he's called by his name, as the apostle says, you have received the spirit of adoption of sons, in which we cry out, Abba, Father. The verse is a little difficult for us because we understand it with St. Paul as referring to Abba, Father, God our Father. And yet there was a tradition Benedict is calling on here explicitly, in which the abbot is called Abba, because Jesus Christ himself, not the Father, but Jesus Christ himself is addressed as Abba, as Father. And so the abbot shares with Christ a common name, a common title, that of Abba, which is Father. And so back to that first verse of the rule, listen, my son, in this school for the Lord's service, Benedict is striving to set up a community in which the abbot has a personal relationship as a loving father with his sons. That relationship is characterized 
as it is in Christ, as life-giving. We cry out, Abba, to Jesus Christ, Father, because it is in Christ that we enjoy our new life, eternal life. Abba, Father, Jesus Christ is the source of our life in that he mediates to us the words of the Father, in that he mediates to us the actions of his Father. And so back to the life of St. Benedict. St. Gregory interrupted his commentaries on scripture because he wanted to show how that Holy Spirit who inspired the sacred authors also inspired the holy men and women in his own day to exemplify the teachings of scripture. And so Benedict becomes a blessing like Abraham for the people of his day. He protects them from Satan. He teaches them the way of obedience. He establishes a fatherly, loving fatherly relationship with them. They come to him to provide food during the famine. They come to him to provide healing when someone has passed away. They come to him to help when simply an instrument has been broken. The father of the abbey, the abbot, is like Jesus Christ, our father who gives us new life, who gives us new life by his words, teachings, and by his actions. The next word to be looked at is school. So Benedict wrote, writes at the end of his prologue, we must therefore establish, we must therefore establish a school, scola, for the Lord's service. Well, school today, as in Benedict's day, could mean many things. It could mean a, a series of, of school buildings. And, and indeed, you know, Benedict um, helps his monks build the monasteries around Subiaco, and then he helps his monks build the monastery of Monte Cassino. But that's not what he's referring to primarily. He's referring, I think, first to a community, so as it were, to a guild, to a group of men, to a group of men and women, to a group of people who share a common skill, a common craft. The rule of St. Benedict is, in a sense, a spiritual art, a spiritual craft. In fact, he describes, Benedict describes the monastery as a workshop. The work the monk does is the spiritual craft that he learns, by which he learns to practice obedience. And so the school is, first of all, a community of men, community of women, who strive to practice this spiritual art, who all want to practice the same spiritual art who come to the monastery because they want to learn to be obedient and thereby to return to their heavenly fatherland, homeland. But secondly, this school is not just a guild, a, a group of people who share a common art. It's a guild, a group of people who share a common ideal. And that ideal is the apostolic community. It's interesting that Benedict quotes St. Luke in the Acts of the Apostle. When St. Luke describes the early Christian community, when St. Benedict is describing the need for radical poverty in the monastery. St. Benedict in chapter 33 of the rule writes, above all, this vice is to be cut out from the monastery at the root, namely that no one presume to give or receive anything without the order of the abbot, nor to have anything of his own, nothing at all, 
for they are not allowed to have free disposal over their own bodies and wills. And then he goes on. All things should be in common, the common possession of all, as it is written, so that no one presumes to call anything his own. That as it is written is from Acts chapter 4. The early Christian community had all things in common. The ideal for the monastic community is this apostolic community, the community of the apostles. And it's not because they prayed, they shared the Eucharist, they broke bread. It's not because they gave to the poor, but it's because they gave up private property. The monasteries, so the apostolic community, could have their own possessions, could have a, you know, community possessions. And the monasteries today do have community possessions. But Benedict is adamant that the monk must root out this notion that I have claim, I can lay claim to property myself. And their basis for laying, so for putting aside all private property among monks, is ultimately that call to obedience. The call that lies deep within our heart as we want to listen to that loving father that is calling each one of us. Benedict again, right? Let no one presume to give or receive anything without the order of the abbot or to have anything as his own. Nothing at all. Why? Because the monk does not, is not allowed to have free disposal over his own body or his will. By entering upon the school for the Lord's service, the monk is not entering upon you know, a, a, you know, a beautiful romantic vision of you know, um, you know, a very regular life. He's entering upon the very hard work of rooting out my self-will, what Benedict calls the voluntas propria rooting out this self-will that leads me to act on my own desires rather than on the will of the Father. Or as Benedict will say later on, rather than acting on the needs of my brother. It's an apostolic community based on poverty. It's also an act apostolic community or a community based on a common obedience. The monk gives up all private property because he wants to be able to follow the will of Christ. He wants to be a blessing for other people. And as Benedict will say, he wants the good of obedience to be shown by all, not only to the abbot, but Benedict says, let that good of obedience, let the brothers obey one another in this way, knowing that through this path of obedience, they will go to God. This school Benedict is establishing is a school of the spiritual art. It's a school in which all of the monks strive to weed out self-will so that they can show this mutual obedience to one another. Benedict goes on in a very beautiful chapter. The next to last chapter, there's 73 chapters in the chapter 72, the chapter on good zeal. St. Benedict describes in more detail this mutual obedience that is made possible by rooting out this effort to um, serve my own will. Benedict writes, no one is to pursue what he judges better for himself, but instead what he judges better for someone else. To their fellow monks, they show the pure love of brothers, to God, loving fear, to their abbot, unfeigned and humble love. Let them prefer nothing whatever to Christ, and may he bring us all together 
to everlasting life. A school for the Lord's service, a community in which all together, the monks all strive to love one another. The monastery must be based on this personal relationship. The relationship is founded first on the abbot who represents Christ, on first on this relationship with Jesus Christ mediated through the abbot. And then through that, through coming into a relationship with Jesus Christ, through obedience to Christ, through the abbot, the monk comes into a personal relationship with each of his fellow monks. No one is to pursue what he chooses, what he judges better for himself, but instead what he judges better for someone else. That's the opposite of what Benedict experienced in Rome when he chose to withdraw from Rome. He experienced in Rome, not just the life of vice, but the life of spiritual vices in which each individual sought ambitiously his own benefits. To their fellow monks, they show the pure love of brothers, to God loving fear, to their abbot unfeigned and humble love. Let them prefer nothing whatever to Christ, and may he bring us all together to everlasting life. A school for the Lord's service. This school is a community. There's one more one more word in that verse from the prologue, from the conclusion of the prologue. Let us now, therefore, establish a school for the Lord's service. We looked at, you know, the mission statement implicit in establish. We've looked at who the one establishing the school is, namely at us, the abbot. We've looked at school. So this community of artisans and the spiritual art doing their warfare to root out self-will and love God and their brothers. It remains still to be seen what Benedict understands by this Dominici Servizii, by the Lord's service. And I think, you know, one can understand, um, you know, in a sense, each command in the rule as part of the Lord's service. Benedict will gloss service, servitium, with work, with opus, with work, uh, with labor, another word for work, with tasks. And yet, you know, we could say that, you know, the work of the, of the school of the, of the Lord's service, the work of the Lord's service is obedience, is silence, is humility, is, is silence, is humility. Those are the three monastic virtues, um, obedience, silence, humility. St. Benedict has a chapter on each one of those three monastic virtues at the beginning of his rule. And indeed, those are the elements, the curriculum as it were, of the Lord's service. But I think first off for Benedict, the Lord's service is gonna be the divine office. Chapter 43 is about monks come late to the office. It's not one of the several monks at the beginning of the rule in which Benedict lays out the order in which the Psalms are to be prayed daily. But it's in the middle of the rule. And so when Benedict is saying, well, if monks fail in this or that, this is the way they are to be punished. And he says in chapter 43, if monks come late, they should suffer the consequences. But he goes on to say, therefore, let him put nothing before the word of God. Let the monk put nothing before the work of, before the work of God. That's not word, it's work. Let the monk put nothing before the work of God, the opus Dei. So the school of the Lord's service in a very real sense is this opus Dei, the work of God. And in what, in what sense is the divine liturgy, is the divine office, 
is the monk's recitation of the Psalter over the course of a week, according to St. Benedict, the service of the Lord. Well, in one very important sense, it's when we praise God. We anticipate here our life in heaven. And those who have studied the sequence of the Psalms point out that Benedict describes the Psalms for morning prayer as the lauds, as the laudes, as the Psalms which begin praise the Lord. That attitude, the Psalms are a praise of the Lord, should permeate our entire prayer of the Psalms. But the divine office is a service of the Lord, is a work, opus Dei, is a work of the Lord. In another sense, when monks pray the Psalms, we are not just praising God, but we were also listening to God. It's the service of the Lord in which the Lord, in a sense, serves us. He speaks to us. So as we pray the Psalms, we hear the word of God. And that throws us back to that first word of the rule. Hear my son. We hear the word of God in the Psalms. And we listen to that word and it transforms us. Hear the word of God as you perform the work of God. And in a very real sense, that is a military service. We are serving the Lord, carrying our brilliant weapons into battle for the true king. And we are listening as we can each day to who is this Lord as he reveals himself to us in scripture? Who are we as he reveals us to ourselves in scripture? And what is he calling us to do as he speaks to us through scripture? And so the school of the Lord's service is indeed the school in which we carry our burden, the work, the labor of obedience, of serving the Lord, of serving our brothers, of carrying out the commands of our life. But it's also in a very real sense, a school of the Lord's service in which we praise God, but also a school of the Lord's service in which we hear the Lord speaking to us. The school that Benedict has established has endured for some 1,500 years, 1,600 years, because it addresses in its mission statement the most fundamental needs of the human heart. And that is to deal with the sense of a coming judgment, to deal with a longing for a relationship to a loving father, to deal with a longing for a return to our home, to deal with a longing for a noble challenge, to do something meaningful in our lives. It's endured for so many years because it is established by a saint, St. Benedict of Nursia, who sets us an example as the holy men of scripture set us example. And we only looked at one, the example of Abraham, through whom God chose to bless all nations as he chose to bless the people of Benedict's day through Benedict. But it's also a school for the Lord's service in which we are the school. We're the guild. We're that group of artisans who together are learning the spiritual art of obedience to Christ first off, to Christ as his will is mediated to us through scripture and then through the abbot and through our community but also to each monk within the abbey. And finally, it's endured because the school for the Lord's service calls us back again and again to hear the word of God in scripture and then to use those very words to praise God. 
at the graduation ceremony, as it were, from this school for the Lord's service. Some might think that one graduates from the monastery and lives the life of a hermit. I don't think that's Benedict's intention. At the end of the prologue, the next to last verse, a verse that St. Benedict did not copy from the master, Benedict writes of the joy he finds in living this life. Benedict writes, as we progress in this way of life and in faith, our heart expanded by the inexpressible sweetness of love, we run the path of God's commandments. Why would God, why would one leave? Why would one leave that monastery? This monastery allows us to live now in some fallen minor way, but in a real way, the paradise to which we hope to come by living a life in the school of the Lord's service. A lot of times I, I um, you know, I try to understand something by way of contrast. And I've spoken a lot this evening about the relationship that Benedict first established between himself and God, and then sought to establish between himself and the monks of the monastery, and sought for the monks to establish among themselves. By way of contrast, you can look at that rule that Benedict drew so heavily on. It's called the rule of the master. And there, the master, who is anonymous, and we just refer to him simply as the master, doesn't refer to his audience as a son. He refers to his audience as a reader. He refers to his audience further as simply a human being, homo, a person, not a son. And so Benedict has introduced in the very beginning of his rule, the first word, listen, my son, not listen, my reader, not listen, human being, generic. And then Benedict, and then the master, by way of contrast, doesn't describe himself, at least implicitly, as a loving father. But he describes himself as a mouth, as simply the mouth through whom God speaks. What sort of man should the abbot be? God speaks to you through the mouth of the master, is the typical structure of one of the rules in the of one of the chapters in the rule of the master. It's not listen, my son, but God speaks to you through the mouth of the master. I hope this has been helpful. It's up to you. I leave it up to you. Um, men and women who are living in monasteries, men and women who are living in families, um, to see how this rule can serve as a basis for your own spiritual life. Um, how the mission of Benedict's rule maybe speaks to your own heart and that could inform your spiritual life. And then how those elements of the school, right? The founder, the abbot, um, the school itself, this community of workmen imitating the acts of the apostles, and then the school, uh, and then the, the Lord's service. So thank you very much. I'll take some questions now and I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Father Peter. Uh, just want to remind our audience that uh, you still can put your questions in at any time and uh, we will uh, organize them uh, appropriately. Uh, so for, uh, I, I have a question I'd like to ask. Um, and it's a, I guess it's the last one. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, work of God or school for the Lord's service. Uh, an objective or subjective genitive. <laughs> perhaps you can explain that for all of us. Yeah. So I tried to um, allude to that at the end of the, at the yeah. end of the little talk. The um, so in, in grammar, um, the um, um, 
the phrase, um, the love of my mother can mean two things. It can be understood subjectively, the love with which my mother loves me, and it can be explained objectively, right? the love with which I love my mother. And that's, um, that distinction carries over, is, is, carry, is carried over into Latin as well. And so the school for the Lord's service can be, as I, as I try to explain, the school in which we serve the Lord. And we serve the Lord, I think Benedict would suggest, um, first off, through the divine office, the Opus Dei. But I think it's also understood, can be understood subjectively. So the Lord serves us in speaking his word to us as we recite the Psalms of the divine office. So I think it's both. Um, thank you. <laughs> That's the kind of question I enjoy. Yeah, yeah, very good. Uh, it's the question that uh, an anonymous attendee asked to maybe explicate a little bit. Um, how could we, you know, some, give some pointers uh, to translate um, the rule for lay people, uh, obviously without obedience to an abbot, uh, uh, with some uh, requirements to live and navigate this world with personal possessions? Uh, how would you go about uh, offering advice to those? I think that's a great question. And I, you know, um, I, I, I deeply believe that the, the principles of the rule um, are fundamental to the human being. So whether we're married or not married, whether we live in a monastery or live in the world, um, I think um, the fundamental principle is listen, my son. So the, the primacy of the personal relationship. Um, the first thing in my life of faith is not this rule or that rule. It's not this way of doing, saying we can come up with all of our examples. The first thing in the life of faith is a personal relationship. And that personal relationship is with Jesus Christ. It's mediated for us human beings. And so I would think in, ideal, in an ideal marriage, it would be mediated through the spouse. So we strive in a marriage, one strives in a marriage to be the sacrament for the other, for the other spouse. So to bring the other spouse to Christ, to manifest Christ's love for the world and our love for one another. And so I think that's one way of practicing the obedience. So understanding the obedience of spouses as um, a form of this you know, obedience we owe, that we owe an abbot, that we owe Christ. And I think the other, um, you know, Benedict's understanding of poverty. Monasteries are, are, you know, not uncommonly wealthy. I mean, they have land. Um, they must provide for institutions. And yet the um, private property must be rooted out insofar, Benedict says, as it prevents one from practicing obedience, from practicing obedience. Insofar as private property leads me to seek my own will, to do my own will. So for a family, right? Uh, we have to have possessions. You need to take care of health issues. We need to send children to schools. We have to have cars and that's good. And yet the question one must ask, I think, is what are we using these for? Um, so, and then finally, a third principle I think that um, would help all of us lay people um, is the notion of a school. So a support group. We need to get together uh, men and women, families that are like-minded and support one another. Um, and uh, so. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we also have uh, with us uh, John Kuntz, who I'll invite to ask his question aloud. John, you're... Hello, Father. Hi. Deeply enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much. The question I have concerns Benedict's relationship to St. Paul. Uh, when you were describing the um, relationship that uh, the observers of the rule have to Christ and then through 
uh, the mediation of the abbot, it reminded me of uh, St. Paul in his letter to Philippians, where he, uh, chapter three, where he talks about, uh, uses the hymn, how Christ um, uh, poured himself out. And then he encourages everyone else to uh, uh, imitate Christ. And in chapter three, verse three, he tells uh, the Philippians to put their, their own interests uh, below the interests of the, the others. And mm -hmm. I was curious whether Benedict had a particular relationship with Paul or whether this is just a generalized um, attitude by the sixth century, this idea of subordinating your own interests and desires to the interests of uh, others. Well, I think the, um, thank you for your question, John. That's, that's a great question. Um, and it's, it's far beyond my expertise, um, <laughs> but I'll, I'll take a stab. Um, I think that the, the idea of subordinating my will to the will of the other is Jesus Christ. Um, and, but I think, um, I don't know St. Benedict's use of St. Paul well enough to say whether he had a particular relationship to St. Paul, whether he had a particular understanding of St. Paul. At the time of Benedict, I do think, I do know that it was a commonplace for writers to refer to the fatherhood of Jesus. Now it wasn't, perhaps commonplace is not the right word. It was known, it wasn't terribly common, but it was still known. And so Benedict is not unique in saying that um, the father, so referring to Jesus as father. And that goes back to Paul's letter to the Galatians, I think, as well as other places, but in which Paul says he is in labor, um, even until now. Um, to give birth to the Galatians. Um, and I believe it's the letter to the Galatians. Um, and so that notion that Jesus is giving birth um, to, um, to Christians, I think um, underlies, so is, the found, is at the foundation of that understanding that Jesus is a father. He's life-giving, uh, giving us the life of Christ. Hope that helps, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me maybe invite Rudolph uh, to um, think about a little bit. Thank you. Yeah, your question. Oh, yeah, sorry, he just sent me a little chat, so I was uh, reading that as well. So Rudolph, you might want to ask your question. Sure. Thank you, Father Andrew. Sure. And thank you, Father Peter, as well. Mm -hmm. I would just took a quick glance. At, at rule 33, one, one through four. Rule 33, one through four, as, as shown on the screen, seems to include more than simply property, as in things, in Benedict's assertion that the members have no possession over their wills and bodies. Mm -hmm. Contrarily, in Acts 4, only, quote, things, unquote, are mentioned by the Apostle Luke as property to be communally shared. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it seems to me that giving up ownership of quote, wills, unquote, least elimination of self-will and replaced with service to the Lord and to others. Mm -hmm. That's plausible. But to say no possession over their, quote, bodies, that causes confusion to many of us, mm -hmm. including myself. Mm -hmm. um, I can see a possible answer for that. Um, but I, I would like to ask you kindly to expound on this a little. And I thank you very much for everything thank you. tonight. Great question. Um, so I, I, um, I think what Benedict is, is referring to there when he says that the monk has um, no possession over his body or over the movements of his will is this, again, is, that, uh, is this um, call to a radical obedience. Um, and the challenge we face as Christians, not just as monks, is to grow in obedience, closeness to Christ, at the same time as we grow in the fullness of our own humanity. So we perfect our will, which allows us to direct our use of the body. We perfect our will in becoming free of sin and being united to Christ, 
united to the will of Christ. And that's a mystery. So how is it that by grace, my will united to Christ is fully my will? And I'm following the will of Christ. Um, but that's, an extent, that's the noble challenge um, that I think is so attractive. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a, an initial stab. Um, I hope that helps. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Mark Barrett. I'll ask it. Uh, could you maybe discuss a little bit on chapter 57? Uh, in light of these injunctions to obedience or humility, uh, what these two things, uh, an artist or a fundamentally creative person, um, may not be well disposed towards uh, such um, virtues. Um, how might an artist best live out this rule? Um, I think the, um, so it's a very good question. I, I just, I hesitate because we have a couple artists at the monastery and if one visits the monastery, there are um, their artworks throughout the monastery created by monks. And if one visits churches in Europe, ancient churches in Europe, medieval churches in Europe, they were largely created by monks. And so there's a way for um, the artisan, so the artist, um, or any craftsman, any worker, and today I would include under that teachers um, or farmers or whatever task one does, to ply his trade, to exercise his trade in the service of others. So not as I, so not in the service of the self, not to um, grow my own status, not to pursue my own ambitions, but to serve the community, so the monastic community, to serve the local community, and then to serve the glory of God. Um, so, um, that's, that's, that's an initial, again, another initial thought. Um, the, um, it is a life that, um, you know, for all of one's time on earth is never accomplished. Um, just as I guess um, life in a, you know, for a married couple is constantly a renewal in this effort to learn to love. And a life in the monastery or a life um, in which we, follow the spirituality of St. Benedict is, is, is a life in which we strive constantly to believe, to grow in faith, that by fulfilling, by, by following Christ's will, my will will be fulfilled, my will will be grown. Um, and we strive to, to grow, not just in holiness, but in a holiness that perfects my humanity. Um, so. Great. Uh, Edward Ship asked, Father, if there's a, how you might explain um, the succession of monastic abbots. Is it a similar concept to apostolic succession, the handing over tradition and authority from one to the other abbots who follow under their guidance and preparation? Uh, if you could just maybe explain that uh, for uh, those. The, um, thank you. Um, it's, I, I smile because um, in the rule of the master, um, which is really so very different from Benedict, um, the master sets up a competition among the monks, uh, among the possible candidates for the abbot's role to get them to compete with one another so who's gonna get the job. And um, that's not the way it is at all in a, in a Benedictine monastery. Um, nobody in his right mind wants to be abbot. Um, the succession is, you know, I, so uh, it is not like um, um, you know, succession in a secular world. Um, at most, it might be like a succession uh, father to son, uh, uh, teacher to student. The uh, community looks at itself when it's time to elect a new abbot. And they ask themselves, who is the man who is able to do the job? And that's, you know... Um, both practical and, and spiritual. And one would hope that um, each abbot prepares the community to find among themselves a successor. Um, 
I would never think of it in terms of apostolic succession. Um, um, there is no laying on of hands. Um, the, um, you know, I, I would, um, you know, a very, I think a very good abbot um, has said recently that he, he strives to maintain continuity, um, not just between him and his, his predecessor, but between him and the two or three predecessors um, before him. And I think that's the continuity of father son, the continuity of teacher, student. Um, so. Hmm. That's a, it's a hard uh, task sometimes to keep uh, so many dynasties in place, you know, in your head as you decide <laughs> to lead, right? To maintain continuity. It's, a, uh, it's, quite it's a, um, harder than it would seem, I would think, to maintain. It's a, it's a, um, it's a terribly hard task. Um, yeah. And that's, that's why I quoted that line from St. Bernard at the beginning. Um, you know, and Bernard was a saint and a genius. Uh, and he, he was so humbled uh, by the task. And, um, you know, all of us who are not saints and not geniuses um, are far more than humbled, humiliated. Um, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a daunting chore. Um, but um, I didn't mention that, but chapter four of the rule is the instruments of good works. And you know, these are the, you know, in a sense, this is the, the curriculum in the monastery. Um, it's in another sense, it's the service we carry out. Um, and it starts off with the, with the great commandment, you know, love God, love neighbor. And it continues with the Ten Commandments, but it ends with never despair of God's mercy. And um, so I think that's a great lesson. Um, yeah, exactly. Well, we certainly thank you for pointing us to uh, both saint and genius and Benedict uh, and uh, encouraging us all, uh, not yet saints, not yet geniuses. Uh, to uh, rely on the Lord's mercy. Uh, and so we thank you for your, uh, your benevolence and your graciousness um, to be with us tonight, Father Peter, uh, as our co-presenter, as the abbot of our, the co-presenting monastery with this uh, series. Uh, so we thank you all. Uh, I'd like to thank our co-sponsors for this webinar series again, the Harvard Catholic Forum, the Nova Forum, the St. Benedict Institute, and Studies in Catholic Faith and Culture at the University of Dallas. Uh, if you like this, you'll receive in your email a survey. Please fill it out uh, to let us know what we're doing well, what we can do differently uh, to better meet uh, your needs as we endeavor to continue our mission to make the Catholic intellectual tradition known uh, more widely and enrich uh, your lives uh, through these kinds of programmings. Um, our next installment of this will be on August 22nd, as I said earlier, uh, with Father John Beyer, and that is entitled The Monastics Before the Scholastics, an Introduction to Medieval Monastic Theology, Sundays, August 22nd at 6 p.m. We have two more yet. So with that in mind, we wish you a good evening. And we look forward to seeing you at another event online uh, and hopefully uh, in person now coming this fall. Have a great evening. Thank you very much.